Walker. Setting up at the seven yard line on fourth down. They fake it to Walker and loft it into the end zone. And a touchdown to Nova Selsky. Give me a break. You think Bob Schmelker, who called that play, is perhaps thinking he's moving on if it doesn't work? And it's popular in Pittsburgh. Brent Novoselsky. And when Wade Wilson put that ball in the air, guys, I didn't think Novoselsky was going to be able to get to it. Well, he has not had a whole lot of practice doing so. He usually is in there strictly to block. Here's the play action, a little bit of it to Herschel Walker. Look at this effort. That's wide receiver all the way. And that is an absolutely perfect throw by Wade Wilson. Novoselsky's second touchdown of the year. Here's Carlos for the extra point. And irony of ironies, Novoselsky started the season with Green Bay. Picked up on waivers by Minnesota and may have just put Green Bay out of the playoffs. A look at the call in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and of course, you can imagine the reaction in Green Bay. Not nearly as jubilant as the Steeler faithful. A Dickensian pronouncement. Hello everyone, this is Tom Moore, better known to most of you as Purple Pain from Vikefans.com. And I'd like to welcome former Vikings tight end and special teams ace, Brent Novoselsky, to our Legends of the Longship broadcast series. Brent, we appreciate you joining us today, and how are you? I'm doing well, thanks Tom. Brent, I know you retired from the NFL after the 1994 season and since have been at GCG Financial in Chicago. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at GCG Financial? Absolutely. Uh, like a lot of the, uh, I went into the financial world. Uh, I do uh, financial advising, uh, insurance investments. I deal with a lot of small and mid-sized companies, entrepreneurs. Um, actually, also deal with a bunch of coaches, uh, both at the NCAA and the uh, and the pro level. It's probably something they appreciate pretty well, given that folks, when they have a relatively short career in professional sports, need somebody to help advise them on their financial direction. I think a lot of the coaches uh, move around so much, they tend to uh, pick up a lot of different financial vehicles and instruments, and it's uh, our job to pull everything together and make sure that uh, you know they have a game plan and that to make sure that, that they have an overview on, on what makes sense to get them all the way to their goals. I know coaches very, very well, and they don't spend a lot of time on that. They've got, uh, obviously, time in the office, breaking down film, and then they've got their families. And the last thing they want to think about, really, is, is their finances. So uh, what we try to do is, is make it easy for them, uh, give them the ability, no matter where they may go, to access all of their financial information. And put you in a unique position to where, for years in your playing career, somebody coached you, and now you're coaching them. Oh, well, that's one of the reasons I, I did that. Uh, when I actually first got out of, of football, I went back to my high school and uh, helped a bunch of the teachers there. Uh, I, I just believe in giving back, and, and those people were so important in my life. I, my teachers, my coaches, uh, those are the ones that, that helped me get to where I've gotten to, and if I can give back to them, then, you know, that, that to me is, is kind of a full circle, and and I love doing it. Recently, we interviewed an old teammate of yours, Todd Kalos, who's president of the Pittsburgh chapter of the NFL Alumni Association. And I understand you've been a treasurer for quite a while for the NFL Alumni Association in Chicago. What activities does your chapter participate in? And are you the only ex Viking that's in the Chicago area? I'm the only ex Viking that I'll let join the uh, organization. I think I snuck in because my rookie year was with the Bears. And I want to play half a season here, and they're actually retiring my number this year, uh, which is really nice of them. You know, I, I did go with the number also, but we don't really talk too much about that. But uh, I spent half half a season here, and then actually went up to Green Bay for an off season, and then hooked up with the Vikings after the first game of the year. But I spent six years up in Minnesota. Um, but since I'm in Chicago, I, they kind of tilted toward the fact that, oh yeah, you're a bear, so I, I'll take it. But my six years in Minnesota, you know, you cut me at three purple. I have been the treasurer for the NFL Players Association, retired Chicago chapter. Um, I'm also on the alumni. Uh, I'm also you know, part of the NFL alumni. But uh, as far as our chapter goes, what we do is it's really giving back to the Chicagoland area. Uh, we give out two 
uh, scholarships a year. A boy and a girl, uh, Chicago area uh, kids going to college. <clears throat> we give them three thousand dollars a year for four years, and we also uh, donate equipment to youth football organizations that uh, that are cash strapped and and need equipment. So those are really the two things. And then what we try to do is bring our guys together and and really help our guys help themselves. Um, it's not so much uh, a gridiron greats organization like. Uh, Mike Ditka has, where they're giving money out and assisting our, our, you know, our guys. Um, what we try to do is we try to give our guys, uh, whether it be uh, uh, free or discounted chiropractic, hearing, vision, dental, um, but we also help them on a business standpoint, both in a networking and a coaching sense. Uh, so we're really trying to uh, allow our guys the springboard of the NFL uh, but also to basically tell them, look, uh, nobody's going to hand you anything. You really need to uh, to uh, work, and, and you know, we'll give the outlet to do that. Growing up in a northern Chicago suburb, I think you grew up in Skokie, Illinois. Were you a Bear fan? Uh, absolutely. I uh, grew up watching Walter Payton. Uh, my brothers and I used to uh, go up in my room, and we would play Walter Payton, meaning I'd have the ball, my brother would block, and my other brother would be on defense, and basically we would flip up in the air and come down on our heads on our bed, or actually my bed. We wound up ruining about five beds that way, and uh, I used to have a light below my room that would flicker, and uh, my parents didn't really like that, but, you know, we were we were born and bred Bears fans, and at that time it was kind of lean in the uh, six, uh, what, 70s and 80s until, until the Super Bowl, which I was actually in college for. But, yeah, you know what? It's like growing up a Cubs fan. It's, it's brutal. You learn to take the bad with the bad. Yeah, I don't think you're alone on that. I think most of us who were football fans growing up, the bed seemed to be a wonderful thing to try to jump over to make it to the end zone. So you're not alone. And given that you were a Bear fan and you started out your career with the Bears, uh, was it unusual in 1989 when you joined the Vikings as a free agent, or did you just view that as a good-paying job and an opportunity for you? It was actually stranger when I went Plan B to the Green Bay Packers. Um, I mean, the reality was when I signed with the Bears, I got fifteen hundred dollars signing bonus, which is about eight hundred and sixty-one dollars net after taxes. And then I got it. Um, my salary was about sixty thousand dollars a year, which uh, the majority of that went to buy tickets for my friends and family because you know, being in Chicago, everybody wanted. Uh, wanted to go to the games, and Green Bay came along and said, we'll give you $25,000 to sign and a $125,000 base and put you three hours away from your family and friends, so it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to stalk you and come down and, and sponge off you for tickets. Right. Uh, I thought that was a, a pretty good deal, so I wound up going to Green Bay that, that off season, and unfortunately they had a, a bunch of tight ends, including a couple of older tight ends, but they wound up cutting me the last cut, and then I wound up hooking up with the Vikings after Carl Hilton had a rear-ending uh, neck injury, and I was after the first game of the season, and I stuck, and the rest, as I say, you know, six years later yeah. was, uh, was a yeah. great career. Absolutely, and, and even though you're in Chicago now, if you still have a rooting interest or you follow the Vikings today, even with all the Bears fans around you, absolutely, I still know a lot of folks in the in the front office. Um, you know, I still have that, that twinge, and you know, Les, Leslie Frazier was uh, was down here. I didn't get to play with Les, um, but I did meet him while he was coaching at Trinity, and I always thought the most of him. I thought, you know, I just think he's a, a tremendous coach, tremendous individual. You got Mike Singletary; he's still there, right? I think he is. But yeah. Mike, Mike, you know, I got to play with Mike, a special player. I mean, when you can play with a Hall of Famer like that, and and just phenomenal, phenomenal individual, and so you know, I still do. Root for, for the Vikings, um, you know, for business, uh, you got to talk Bears down here. Sure. And uh, I'm pretty adept at doing that also. Well, the good news is is people started to back away from their speaker when they heard Green Bay Packers come out of you. They just got a little closer when, when they heard that you still have a rooting interest somewhat for the Vikings. And I wonder this when you talk to clients or people in Chicago and they, they discover that, boy, you were a member of the bitter rival Minnesota team, how do they react to that? You know what, they, they, they give me a little bit of grief, but it really depends on how, you know, how the Bears are doing versus how the, the Vikings are doing. Um, the good news is all these charity golf outings I go to, there's all these carts and clubs, and, and I can pick mine out because I've, I'm the only one with Vikings head covers. <laughs> and, and anybody that's got a bear head cover is nowhere near you. 
That's right. <laughs> well, you took an interesting path to the NFL, uh, and you elected to attend college at the University of Pennsylvania, which is not traditionally considered a, a, as a hotbed for cultivating I, NFL talent in the modern era. When you made your decision to become a, a Quaker, did you have any ambitions at that time to play professionally in the NFL? Uh, well, my choice actually was, I had two choices. I actually was going to go to Michigan. And uh, that was something that I always wanted to do. I actually went to the University of Michigan's camp when I was in co- uh, high school my junior year. Uh, met Anthony Carter there real quickly, uh, which is kind of interesting because I want to play with Anthony on the uh, Vikings. But I wanted to go to I wanted to go to Michigan. I wanted to go to business school there. I wanted to play there. And they had offered me a chance to walk on. They weren't going to offer me a scholarship, and they had uh, agreed to pay my admission fee which I thought was great. I was happy to, you know, give me a chance to earn it. Uh, what happened was they wound up never paying my admission fee, and I was calling my recruiting coach every day and never got an answer from him. Back then, you know, he'd leave him a message and nothing. Uh, I got a call from the admissions office saying, if you'd like to uh, apply for a school, we need your admission fee. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, the football office is supposed to take care of that. And they said, we have nothing to do with the football office which I thought was kind of a joke in Michigan. But Mm -hmm. anyway, I wound up sending him a check. And a week later, I got admitted, or actually got approved for admissions. I got a call from the coach back saying, congratulations, we want to set up your housing. And I said, "Uh, I'm not going to your school. Uh, You lied to me about that. What else are you going to lie to me about? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I'd met the University of Pennsylvania coach, Don Doe, to come and he's up at Dartmouth now, but he had uh, recruited me, and, you know, the opportunity at Penn at the time, they had just begun turning the program around. Um, they were not very good in the 60s and 70s, and in the early 80s they started getting really good, and it was a chance to build a, a program, and it was exciting, and then, you know, you hear the word in school of business and a chance to go to the number one business school in the nation, and I thought that would be a better choice for me than the University of Michigan, which, by the way, um, the the check that I wrote was for $15. <laughs> you know, it's not about the amount. It's about the principle of the thing. And as you said, when you select Pennsylvania instead of Michigan, you get an awfully good education to go along with it, so not the worst move in the world, that's for sure. Well, and it actually turned out okay also because my rookie year with the Bears, uh, my roommate with the Bears was Jim Harbaugh who was actually the Michigan quarterback at, you know, when I would have gone. So it, life's got a way of working itself out. Absolutely. And, you know, while you were at Penn, I know maybe the crowning moment of your career there was, you know, a perfect 10-0 and record in, in 86. And in, in that season, I know you had a three-touchdown uh, game against Navy. What do you remember about that season and that game where you had three touchdowns? Uh, that, was, that was one of the greatest seasons ever. That was a magical season that, Nobody really knew what we were going to do. We, we actually had a brand new head coach. Uh, Jerry Burnt was our head coach and he had really built the program and dug it out from the, uh, from the ground up and, and really built a phenomenal program. And then he wound up leaving, uh, to go to Rice and uh, Ed Zubra took over. And we, nobody ever really expected us to, to do anything that year, but we had so much talent that uh, we just dominated. And the Navy game was one of the hardest games I've ever played in, in college pros anywhere. Uh, those guys were, were strong. They were tough. We just couldn't move the ball on them on the ground. We wound up uh, taking it to air, to the air, and uh, was, was very fortunate to uh, have the ability to, to catch a bunch of touchdown passes. And it still remains as one of, uh, one of the greatest moments coming out of that game and just the feeling that, you know what, we, we came in there and, and we beat the academy. It was their homecoming uh, they packed the stands. They had all of the cadets. They, they were in dress uniforms. They stood up on the entire game. Every time they scored a touchdown, they shot off this cannon in the end zone. Mm-hmm. And we go back for the kickoff return, and, you know, it smelled like a, a war zone there. So that was, that was awesome. And then, uh, you know, being able to, to do that for a full season was, uh, was really, really special. I still wear my, my championship ring every day. And uh, extremely proud of that. With a ten and zero record, was Penn considered for a for a bowl game that season? Yeah, uh, in fact, we were invited to a bowl game. Uh, we should have been. We actually we were one double A, and we should have been in the one double A playoffs. But you know the ridiculousness of the NCAA, the ridiculousness of the Ivy League, which basically says uh, football teams cannot play 
uh, in postseason games. They wouldn't allow us to go to a bowl game. It was it was in their rules. But you know they allow basketball to play in the tournament. They allow baseball to play in the, every other sport. They allow to play in the tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, football they don't want to play in the tournament because uh, I don't know it's, it's the monster. I guess uh, and it's it's antiquated just like the NCAA is. And it was a ridiculous rule. Prior to the season, they made us sign a form that said if we went to a bowl game then we would allow them to drug test us. Okay. And then I basically raised my hand and said, well, we can't go to a bowl game. And they said, well, we know, but you need to sign that anyway. You know, you get an Ivy League student who's, you know, they're really smart. Right. And you give them that type of uh, logic. Yeah, that's uh, that'll, that'll, that kind of gives you an idea of where we are. Yeah, that'll cause a little brain lock. When you left the Packers and, and came to the Vikings as a free agent, as we talk to people, we often hear about their experience in the NFL draft. And what I'm curious about from you is, what were the different challenges a free agent faces in their quest to make an NFL club, You know, whether it be less reps or you're buried on the depth chart? And, and this is really going to be not only your experience with Minnesota, but when you came in with Chicago and, and made an attempt to get into the NFL. Oh, I'll tell you what, yeah, coming as a free agent, don't get, you don't get a lot of chance. Basically, you you need to do all the little things really, really well, and that's that's where special teams came in. Uh, you know, I always said I'd, I'd clean the locker room, I'd, I'd line the field if I needed to, and, and you have to have that attitude that you're going to do whatever it takes. The thought is you're going to make it as hard as you can for them to cut you, right. and do so many different things, and you know try to be there. And then what you're doing is you're biding your time, waiting for for that moment, waiting for that opportunity. If somebody gets hurt or somebody messes up or whatever it may take, it, it, there's a lot of talented guys out there. And, you know, there's a pool of guys at the beginning of the year that just kind of travel from team to team and, and just looking for an opportunity. And the tough thing about that is you're not injured and you just you just can't make it and you just don't hook up. It's hard to, to know when to give up the game. You know, you get a lot of guys three, four years in, and they're still bopping around, still working out, and they can't start their lives because this is their dream and what they want to do. I got very, very lucky. I basically got cut with, you know, the Bears um, for a couple of weeks. I wound up starting to look for a job, and three weeks later, Emory Moore had broke his leg. The fourth game of the season, the Bears called me, and I was I was playing. Actually, first game was at Lambeau at the beginning of October. Bears, uh, Bears Packers, um, that, that was, that was amazing. That was, uh, walking out on a field of dreams and you can, you can feel the, the, you know, everybody that played on that field and the legends and you know, that was an amazing point for me. And, you know, then going to, uh, the Packers and the offseason and they, they caught me. So I was out of work for about a week and uh, looking for a job and deciding, oh, you know, my football career is over and then the Vikings called. I think the the best thing about that, Brent, is you know because they called you, you didn't have to make the call to the Detroit Lions because they were about all that was left <laughs> in the Central. Uh, that, well, the Tampa Bay was also in the Central at the time, right. but that that's another story altogether. Uh, but I'll tell you the, the way it worked out was I'm in Chicago and the Vikings called me and I grabbed you know grabbed a plane ticket. I took a, a small bag, basically uh, my contacts and uh, and a, a change. I don't know even know if I, I think I bought a T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went and worked out, and I figured, up oh, they're going to send me right home. They kept me there for hours on end, and uh, Coach Bad at the time, Tom Bad was, uh, was our uh, uh, special teams coach, mm-hmm. uh, came in and said, oh, we're going to sign you. And so right now, he goes, yeah. So they want to put me out up at the days in. I really didn't have a change of clothes, which didn't really matter. You know, when you're an NFL player, you don't really pay for any clothes that you wear during the season. You're wearing sweats and you know, maybe my underwear I paid for, yeah. but everything else they give you. But the fortunate thing was that first game we played the Bears down in Chicago. So we, I was actually able to uh, come down here and, and, you know, Jerry Burns let me take some time off and get my car and drive back up. And then, uh, yeah, that, that's, you just do what you got to do. And probably that's when the family came out of the woodwork again and made all the ticket requests again. <laughs> well, the fortunate thing is it was much farther. It was much longer drive, so... What we would do is we'd have family come in every weekend, but you didn't get inundated. Hey, Brent, you mentioned tryouts, and oftentimes, even today, we hear, hey, the Vikings brought in so-and-so for a tryout, and oftentimes they don't sign them, sometimes they do. What do they take you through? What is the typical paces a team takes you through when they bring you in for a tryout? They just they want to see you run. They want to see you run some patterns. 
They take you through, they add some basic stuff, maybe hitting a sled. Usually no. Usually they just take you out and, and throw you some balls. They just want to see how you look, how you're moving. They talk to you. They, they mostly watch films. You know, if you get some films that, that you've been on. So well, that's why the preseason is so important to, uh, to, to guys like me that, uh, you know, kind of the backup. Uh, that's where we get our, our biggest playing time. And, and if you can get some film, that's what they really want to see. They want to look at that and, and just make a determination. And, and for the most part, you know what, it's like anything else, it's kind of a crapshoot on their part. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of waiting around and, and hoping, and you just got to gotta stay in shape for that and, and just, you know, hope you get an opportunity. People think of you as a pass receiver being a tight end, but the reality is you were a vital part of the Vikings as a special team player where you made over 100 tackles in your career, which is an enormous amount on special teams. What was the secret to your success on special teams? What makes a good special teams player? Uh, fair. <laughs> Yours or theirs? Uh, well, hopefully it's theirs. You know, I equate it to going off into a forest preserve or a wooded area with a helmet on and closing your eyes and running as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And when you get hit by the first tree, picking yourself up as quick as you can and keep on running. And when you get hit by the second tree, you can open your eyes mm -hmm. and keep running. Bullets are flying, and you just you try to avoid as much as you can uh, getting blindsided and getting flipped and being on ESPN for all the wrong reasons. Uh, reasons. That, that, that was the biggest fear was, was being on national television in front of millions of people. Um, getting your bell rung or getting flipped, and that you try to avoid that. But really, it's running downfield with your head on a swivel, you're getting a feel for you know you got a guy blocking you, you got to know what to do around him, and you got to find the ball. And it's putting yourself in the right position. And that that was what I would do. I would just uh, you know, first of all, it, it's a want to job. You got to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want it bad enough, then you're not going to be able to do it. And for me. It was it was cool because um, you know at college I I was starting but I also played special teams so I was I was all for it I loved it I just grabbed it and said you know what I can make it in this league and make a decent living just by doing this and what you were doing is you were usually facing guys that hadn't played special teams because they were starters on big programs and they never really taught them how to do that and they were usually not really happy to be playing special teams. It was usually thought of as kind of the grunt work, uh, and these guys all wanted to be starters, and they thought it was below them. And for me, I was just happy to be there and like, hey, you know what? If you're going to give me this opportunity, absolutely. I'll uh, I'll go out there and, and I'll make a name for myself. And it was fun. I, I love being able to hit somebody as opposed to being hit. You talk about the release on a, on a on a punt coverage, and when kids come up through middle school and high school now, they're always taught to do one of two things. It's it's wait to hear the ball hit. But when you get in a professional stadium, that's probably not possible. What is your your clue to go downfield? Is it a, is it a count in your head, or how do you decide that? Well, it, it, it really got to be a count in the head. It really got to be understanding you know, what the timing was, when you could release, as far as, as hearing a boom, you know, you, you could kind of hear it, but you didn't really listen for it. You tried to get away with wherever you could. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I was downfield or at least maybe a yard downfield before he kicked it. Right. You know, you try to get a little advantage there. But you always knew when it got blocked. Uh, we didn't have a lot blocked, but uh, you can tell when something bad went on in the backfield because the, you hear the crowd. Uh, punt, if you're on the way downfield and you hear you know, the crowd getting up, uh, that's not usually a good thing. So you, you kind of get a feel for that. But I think what's most important is that everybody needed to do their job. I mean, that really was the place where you had 11 guys needing to work together. Um, and if 11 guys didn't do their job, you were going to have some issues. You know, you had to cover your lanes. You had to be uh, spaced properly. And, and then you had to beat your block the right way. So yeah, I took a lot of pride in that. You know, to me, that, that was uh, something that's kind of unsung. Nobody knows how difficult it is uh, to do that. You, you just, you know, you look at it on the field, and the problem is they don't really cover it too much on TV either. You don't really see the intricacies of it. Uh, they kind of gloss over it, and, oh, here's a fair catch. You don't see all the work that goes into it. And, you know, that's a 40 to uh, 60, 70 yard dash that you're doing probably 10 to 12 times in a game. And that's what really made, you know, my lungs hurt after a game was how fast and hard I was running 
on every play. You just can't take a play off, not a special teams play, because that, that could be in a touchdown. And you're right about the attention. It's much like, like line blocking is nobody gets to notice it until they decide to circle it and show something that went wrong. <laughs> So, yep. it, it, <laughs> so you mess up. It's a tough life. Well, even with all your special teams contributions, Vikings fans' most lasting memory of Brent Novoselsky was your 1989 season finale touchdown catch on a fourth and goal versus the Bengals that knocked them and the Green Bay Packers out of the playoffs at the same time and secured the NFC Central Division for the Vikings. On a scale of 1 to 10, the difficulty of that twisting over-the-shoulder catch had to be an 11. And I'm, I'm interested from you, can you give us your recollections about the play in the game, and were you always intended to be the primary receiver on that play? Yeah, I remember that game, like you know, obviously like it was yesterday. And, and the cool thing about that is I made that catch like probably a million times on my street in Skokie, Illinois, with a Nerf football. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that was a, like the one catch I used to practice all the time, the over-the-shoulder get your feet in, put one foot down, drag the, the top of the other foot, and and just focus on the ball. And, and I would make that catch a million times. We had practiced that play a bunch that year. Um, what I would do is the game, the night before the game, I would always you know, kind of uh, lay in bed and, and visualize what I was going to do the next game. And I, I visualized making that catch. I think Jesse Owens said it uh, you know, when they asked him, when, when did you know you were going to win the race, how you had a dash, and he said on the boat over mm-hmm. when I visualized it. And I think that was the same thing that happened to me. I visualized it. I just I just knew I was going to make that catch. I was the primary receiver, but you got to understand, on that team, you had Herschel Walker, who was our running back that we gave up probably, what, 9, 10, 12, uh, 18 People for right. Um, I think we gave him. We gave him our team jet. We gave him everything. So you got Herschel Walker. You got Anthony Carter, one of the greatest of all time. You got Chris. Uh, wait, Chris didn't come that year, but you got Anthony. You got Hassan Jones. You got Steve Jordan, pro bowler. You got Rick Fenny, who was a uh, workhorse, and then you got me. And, and the idea was, I was always at that third tight end, that H H back on on the short yardage goal line. I always go in motion and and pick up the you know the cornerback or you know, linebacker on the outside, and, and this was the kind of play where I just sold out and, and made it look like it was going to be a run and then broke to the corner of the end zone, and, you know, Wade uh, Wilson just threw the ball up. And I remember looking back, and, you know, the white of the Metrodome versus the, the brown of the football, and I can actually, everything slowed down, and I could actually read uh, the commissioner's name on the football. Oh, man. And it just it seemed to be so slow, and I just watched it and watched it all the way to my hands, Never realizing until I saw the pictures afterward that the linebacker that was actually taking me on the play had his hand on my face mask and was ripping my head back. So it was one of those moments in time where, you know, everything came together, all of that hard work. I mean, that was hours and thousands and thousands of hours of catching balls and, and you know, getting to practice early and leaving practice late and, and just, just catching, working on my hands and, you know, that was all effort and then came together and the fact that it put us into the playoffs and, and knocked the, the Packers out was, uh, that was just, that was a nice little topping. Well, never has a one yard pass in Viking history been so important. So it was great for all the fans. So we appreciate you giving us that memory. My and- pleasure.